Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is great to see such a packed house, both here in person and then virtually as well. Uh, my name is Andrew Bennett, and I work in the Community Development Department at the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. I am also the co-lead for this summit, and in that role, I want to give a huge thank you to all of you, the speakers, the moderators, attendees, uh, all the staff that helped put this together. A huge thank you for making this become a reality. Um, what's amazing is when you pause for a moment, which I haven't done much of today, and uh, you just you look around, it's incredible because there are hundreds of mission-driven individuals here who are having a huge impact across this country and beyond. Um, so thank you for being here, thank you for being you and what you do and those you serve uh, back in your respective communities. Now, we just had a tasty lunch. I know it was short, but uh, this next session, I think, will be energizing and very interesting. It is called um, Forward Thinking, How Practitioners Can Support, Engage, and Foster Thriving Small Businesses. It is being moderated by Beiju Shaw, who is the president and CEO of the Greater Cleveland Partnership. With over 12,000 organizations, Greater Cleveland Partnership is the largest metropolitan chamber of commerce in the nation. So that means we're very lucky to have Beju here. He's got a lot of expertise and uh, thankful that he's moderating. So with that, um, I'm going to hand it over to Beju to facilitate this meaningful conversation. Thank you, Andrew. And, and I just want to make it clear, I had no royal engagements that I had to turn down <laughs> for uh, joining you here this afternoon. Um, as one of our earlier panelists, or one of our earlier speakers said, small businesses are indeed the life force of the U.S. economy. And what we want to talk about this afternoon as you continue your lunch is a panel on sort of the state of current, the current state of small businesses. I'm joined by three outstanding panelists up here, and I'm going to allow each of them to briefly introduce themselves. And I'm going to start on the far end with Carolyn Cauley, the president of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation. Carolyn. Great. Thank you, Beiju. I'm Carolyn Colley. I'm president of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation in Washington, D.C. You may know that the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is the world's largest business advocacy organization, but I, I always am asked if there are any myths around that, and so I'll just name um, three quickly. Um, one is that we're not the government. A lot of people think that we're the Department of Commerce. We're not. We're down the street from the Department of Commerce. We represent um, millions of businesses, large, medium, and small. Um, the second one is that we own all of the local and state chambers around the country, like the Greater Cleveland Partnership, also not true. Um, we've got about 1,500 chambers that are members of ours. Um, and third, that we only do advocacy and lobbying, also not true. Um, we have quite a large um, foundation inside, which I'm lucky enough to run, and we're doing the community side of that work and the workforce work. So um, I'm happy today to kind of weave in between. I wear two hats, one at the chamber and one at the foundation. So um, today I get to tell the story um, from both sides. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Carolyn. And we are indeed members of the U.S. Chamber. So. <laughs> Um, next to Carolyn, we've got Larry Fulton. Larry is a serial entrepreneur and equity investor. I'm going to let him introduce himself a little bit about his Thank background you. and experience. So I'm Larry Fulton. Um, I'm from the Cleveland area. Um, I spent about 17 years in corporate America. Um, my undergrad degree was in business administration. I got an MBA here, right here in Cleveland from the Weatherhead School of Management at Case Western Reserve. I did my first uh, small business acquisition in 2003. Uh, I bought another company and merged those two businesses in 2005. Um, did other transactions along the way, including uh, about three more bolt-ons, a joint venture. And then fortunately, I recently sold uh, my first acquisition uh, just last April. Um, and um, I'm running a small manufacturing company right now here in Cleveland. And I'm also doing a search. So I'm looking for an acquisition as well. So um, very uh, glad to be here. Thank you. Great, right, thanks, Larry. And finally, we've got Jerry Agape. Jerry is the Regional Small Business Administration Administrator for the Great Lakes Region. Jerry. Hi. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Beju, thank you so much for hosting this panel, and I'd like to thank the Cleveland Federal Reserve for also uh, inviting me to this panel. Uh, I'm the Regional Administrator for the SBA, overseeing six states here in the Great Lakes Region, including OH. 
All right, there we go, right there. Uh, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Michigan as well. Um, I was appointed by the White House to oversee the operations, including the outreach engagement, lending operations, but also supporting the field offices here in the Great Lakes region. Uh, Ohio uh, is uh, one of the areas that I cover, and it is so it's a strong area uh, as well, uh, creating 99.6% of businesses are actually small in the state of Ohio, with creating over 2 million jobs in the state of Ohio. So I'm excited to be here today. Um, prior to my role, I was, some of you may know me, I was at a national nonprofit organization overseeing the Midwest operations and national women's entrepreneurship. I have a background in entrepreneurship and workforce development, policy and business development as well. Uh, and I'm actually very pleased because I learned that Larry is a former SBA employee and alumni as well. So you've got two uh, That's great. good forces here uh, to champion SBA. Uh, SBA is the federal agency that is providing resources for anybody who has a dream of becoming an entrepreneur. And we are the only cabinet level agency devoted to everything small business. Wonderful. So we're going to have a uh, moderated conversation here. I'm going to start with our three guests uh, to have set the table for a conversation. Then we're going to open it up for audience Q&A. So think about your questions as we uh, go through our conversation. And in about 20 minutes, we'll turn it back to all of you to see what's on your mind for our three wonderful panelists. Now I'm going to start with a, a question for each of you to, to uh, just reflect on. Here we are in June 2023. We've talked about some of the issues, certainly in our listening session, uh, just now about what's facing both individuals as well as small businesses. And I wanted to get from your, each of your perspectives your sense of just kind of a heat check on what is the current state of small businesses. They are so vital, as we know, both in numbers but also jobs for our entire country. I'm going to start, Carolyn, with you. What's your sense of sort of how are small businesses doing here in June of 2023? Uh can I just start here quick with an audience poll question? Sure. If we're going to set the table, maybe we can put the placemat down. Do we have a shared definition of what is a small business? Oh, that's a great question. Right? Like how big is big? How, how small is big? How small is small? I think it, it changes from agency to agency sometimes and certainly from individual to individual. So. I, if you, anyone thinks that they have the right answer, I'd love to hear it, and, and maybe my fellow panelists can tell me how they. Well, you know, so we judge do have a, a formal business. definition at the federal government. So Jerry, you have a, you yeah, we do have a federal uh, formal federal uh, definition for the federal government. Uh, size of small businesses, as our economists have also sussed out as well, is um, you know micro businesses uh, under 10 employees, which also includes self-employed entrepreneurs, 1099. But we will go all the way up to 500, depending on the industry, because of manufacturing as well, and according to the economics and the revenues also. So when I said earlier that 99.6 percent of businesses on Ohio were considered small under the SBA definition, uh, that's where we look at small businesses who are creating two-thirds of the jobs in the state of Ohio. Yep. Yeah. Um, well, I think I mentioned earlier that um, the Chamber of Commerce's membership is um, it, it's several million members across all sectors, and so that gives us a really unique position to not just look at sector or size. Um, or geography, and we have a couple of ways that we take a temperature check or take the pulse um, almost on a daily basis and certainly monthly and quarterly. Um, one of our um, kind of most widely cited pieces of research is a report that we do on a quarterly basis in association with MetLife called the Small Business Index, and each one has a theme around it. The next one will come out next Wednesday, um, so you can go online and, and look for that. But I got a couple of, um, of the data points from our editor as I was leaving yesterday to kind of respond to your question about you know, where are people's heads right now and where are the worries. Um, but the survey of ours found, interestingly, that this is the sixth consecutive quarter where inflation tops the list um, as the top challenge. That was 54% of small business owners who were, um, who were polled, followed by rising interest rates, supply chain, and revenue. So it's a pretty consistent story. We learned that half of them have delayed plans to grow. Um, half of them have taken out a loan to cover rising costs. Um, and they're turning to more sources for capital than they were at this time a year ago. So more personal loans, um, family, friends, um, their own savings. 
So what's interesting about that, though, is that on the, on the qualitative side, there's still such a sense of entrepreneurial hope and hustle. Um, half of them are more hopeful about their ability to succeed and grow than they were a year ago at this time. Um, and as Governor Bowman talked about earlier, we're still seeing a high number um, of new business starts, which is um, I, something you know, we really like to see. I think 140,000 or so new business applications in Ohio, um, which is a really great number. So um, I, there are a couple of other data points that I can share throughout the conversation, but that's kind of the big picture coming out of our report. Um, that will be out next week. So entrepreneurs are, are unique in that the glass is always more than half full. It doesn't matter if there's any water in the glass, the glass is always more than half full. <laughs> and you've got to have that sort of belief given all the challenges to start and grow any type of business. There are, you've been involved and are involved right now with a number of businesses. What's your sense of how are your, how's your portfolio of ventures, how are they feeling right now as small businesses? You know, I, I think what, what comes to mind is that there's a number of headwinds um, that are impacting, that's impacting the nation, national economy. Um, higher interest rates, uh, low unemployment, um, high uh, job openings, obviously. There's a lot of geopolitical issues that's happening right now. China, the United States, China, Taiwan. Um, you have the Russia, Ukraine issues that are happening on a global scale. Um, and those are creating some headwinds that's, that's certainly impacting the economy. However, you know, uh, unemployment being so low, that means a lot of people are actually working. And these working individuals have a lot of money. And they're spending their money on goods and services. They're buying things. And I think that's still, on a consistent basis, driving the economy. And the economy still remains very hot. Um, the, the elephant in the room, however, that I think is primarily slowing down economic surge is labor unavailability. Mm -hmm. And because of that labor unavailability, um, I, I believe that the demand is not truly being met. The other thing that I'm seeing that would really support some of the entrepreneurial activity around the country is that on the startup side, on the VC side, um, uh, last year was the second highest year on record in terms of VC activity across the country. On a little larger, if you go up that scale of, of business activity, in private equity, there's over a trillion dollars worth, worth of dry powder that's sitting on the sidelines looking to do deals, a trillion dollars. So um, that's, that's a lot of cash. And then lastly, I'd say on the banking and finance side, um, banks, you know, certainly because of all the activity that was happening in March, banks are very conservative at this point in time, but they're still lending on good deals. So if it, if it was a deal that was going to happen last year, it's still pretty much going to happen this year, but some of the credit standards might be a little tightened. Um, for an example, instead of being maybe a 10% equity requirement to do that transaction, a bank might insist on a 15 or 20% equity requirement. Um, I, I think banks are, are primarily, primarily looking for um, loan repayment ability to be stronger in that, that sense as well. Yeah. And I want to tease out a couple things that you said there because I think it's important. As I talk to uh, audiences about small businesses, oftentimes, the picture of the small business is a neighborhood business or a solopreneur, not recognizing that the small businesses also include many different types of diverse goods producing firms that are completely impacted by global issues, right? And that have supply chains that extend across the world, not just you know in their local neighborhoods or, or states or regions. So thanks for flagging those issues, Larry. Jerry, you know, uh, Larry talked a little bit about capital, uh, capital availability, banks changing standards. You're obviously involved in financing all sorts of small businesses across the Great Lakes. What's your sense of how businesses are doing? Uh, well, you know, we're really excited about the state of small businesses here in the Great Lakes region and nationwide under President Biden and Administrator Guzman, who is, by the way, it's, she's the highest ranking Latina cabinet member in the president's cabinet, and the president has had the most diverse administration out of all presidential administrations. Um, under President Biden, we were very excited with the bipartisan infrastructure law that was passed, the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, and also the Chips and Science Act for small businesses. What this means is an opportunity to reinvest and investing in America to create those jobs. In terms of financing, we've actually, you've heard about the tightening of some of the banks for the credit. 
we're actually um, deploying and modernizing the SBA with new rules to further broaden access to capital to so many of the small businesses, especially the smallest of the small, some of those who were left out during the pandemic or who may not have been able to access capital for that. Uh, we've also created a program called the Community Navigator Pilot Program, which we are using that force multiplier effect of a hub and spoke model to meet small business owners where they're at, the smallest of the small, to make sure that they know who the SBA is and access our affordable financing. With the financial products that we have, we've also made an effort to modernize our SBICs, which is our small business investment companies. One of the things that we're doing is making an investment specifically with guaranteeing loans so that these companies can deploy debt or equity that has an SBA guarantee on the end to give them the additional support they need for that innovative STEM-based company uh, with the Department of Defense and such so that we can support growth in this region, uh, Greater Cleveland region, but also the Great Lakes region for the innovative companies that can also uh, grow from small to larger companies and create those jobs. One of the things, and I, I would be remiss if I did not point out that June is also uh, Immigrant Heritage Month that President Biden also uh, acknowledged. We have the potential of immigrant entrepreneurs and the diaspora uh, entrepreneurs. We know that one in five small business or business owners in general actually are immigrant entrepreneurs as opposed to Native Americans. 80% of them are likely to start up businesses. We've made a concerted effort at the SBA um, under it, Administrator Guzman and my colleague, uh, Associate Administrator Gabe Esparza. He and I were just recently on the road talking about the potential of diaspora based small businesses, the higher likelihood that they are to understand exporting. 96% of consumers globally outside the United States actually are a potential for small businesses here in the Great Lakes region and Greater Cleveland for the diaspora-based communities to actually begin exporting not only their products, but actually services are higher in exporting than products. We tend to think of it as products. It's also consulting services as well. So, you know, the future looks bright uh, for entrepreneurship. We have seen a small business boom under President Biden two consecutive years in history of the, you know, the highest startups of business application. And thank you for pointing out unemployment. Um, I'm sure everybody here has most have watched Sesame Street. Uh, <laughs> we, we actually have had the loan of the lowest unemployment in history since when Sesame Street first premiered. So you're probably thinking way back when, wow. But you know, just to give you an idea about the state of the economy moving forward uh, and what we're doing with, through bipartisan legislation under President Biden, it is really looking positive for the greater Cleveland area and the Great Lakes region, which we have a tremendous resource also with the Great Lakes states and also doing trade and exporting with Canada as well. That's great, thank you. And so I, mean, I would just say from the greater Cleveland region perspective, the state of small businesses right now is super strong. And so, it, but it is this duality that each one of you has noted, which is the optimism, the growth, the demand is clearly there, but the challenges that are both facing, addressing the demand, but also potentially on the horizon. So with that, let me, um, let me start, let's start talking about the opportunities that you see for small businesses. What are some of the emerging areas? Jerry, you talked a little bit about the legislation uh, that's been passed recently in DC. Can you talk a little bit about what types of opportunities that creates in particular for small businesses? Yeah, and it isn't just legislation. I would like to point out an opportunity for the current small businesses that have 7A loans, one of our uh, flagship loan products, uh, the SBA has actually suspended uh, fees, zero fees, for those who have current loans through September uh, 30th of 2023. That means more dollars in those small business pockets and savings of hundreds uh, in those fees for that. And we're trying to you know, modernize the SBA and understanding meeting owners where they're at, understanding that life happens, you know, supply chain issues and such as well. With the legislation, let me give you a great example right here in the state of Ohio. The Small Business Regional Exporter of the Year. A few weeks ago, I was very uh, proud and honored to present an award to the Small Business Regional Exporter of the Year, who actually beat all the other small businesses in the region to be the Exporter of the Year in Pequa, Ohio, Hartsell Hardwoods. And with the, the uh, business trends that we're seeing and the Chips and Science Act, the investments in STEM and technology, learn that that small business, family-owned small business, is also doing business with Intel. What type of is it? They are a they do hardwoods, but they also make fans. They spun their business off into making fans with the hardwoods because they started off with propeller fans. Okay. 
and such with, a, uh, I think they're, they're multi-generational family owned. So this side uh, adjacent business that the family has, less than 50 people, is also benefiting from the investments that we're making with anchor uh, corporations like Intel. And they have a contract with them to clean the air with the fans and supplying that. So that's a really wonderful example about how a small business is benefiting from legislation at a national level and seeing it in action was such a surprise for us, a very good surprise, but I said, you know, I'm gonna use you as an example about how this national legislation is actually supporting small businesses when we think about the investments with Ohio being the new Silicon Valley and the Battery Beltway going across from California and such, what does that mean for small businesses to partake in this? Uh, but also it's, it's a concerted effort to also diversify the number of small businesses who are doing business with the federal government. Yeah, talk a little bit about that because that's another significant push I know from the administration is to really expand federal contracting to small businesses. Absolutely, and under Administrator Guzman and President Biden, there's a concerted effort because we've seen a decline in small businesses doing business with the federal government over the last decade. We've actually held up a mirror to ourselves and the first time disaggregated the data about what the racial, ethnic, gender makeup of small businesses that are actually getting federal contracts. And we're doing that so that we can have a benchmark for ourselves and deploy the readiness and the outreach and engagement that SBA has on the ground with our partners like COSI, um, with the Small Business Development Centers, with the Urban League. We've got a strong, vibrant partnership with the Urban League here to make sure that small businesses understand this is another way to diversify their revenues that the federal government has a reliable um, uh, way of also getting paid on time with the revenues, and that they can do business with the largest purchaser of goods and services, again, services, in the world. So we're making that concerted effort. Kellen, what are you seeing in terms of small business growth opportunities, emerging areas? Well, I think the theme that you're going to hear probably from this whole panel is about the power of connectivity. Right, that, uh, and studies have shown that small business owners are more likely to thrive and succeed when they're part of an ecosystem, when they're part of a community, when they've got a mentor, they've joined a chamber, they're in someone's supply chain, they have um, a, a wider network that's growing all the time. And so I think this it, theory of connectivity is really important. Um, as we say a lot, like, you know, you can't hate big business and love small business because it's one ecosystem that has to work together, particularly on supply chains um, and skills training. But what I think, a couple of things that I wanted to, um, to say in regards to supply chains, it's such an important um, business model. We know that 96% of the people who buy our things don't live here, so free trade is a really important um, piece of that. But we run um, a, a website, a digital um, journalism site called Co, it's Grow With Co, that has now gotten about 20,000 visitors a day coming for straight up news you can use, business information. So think of like an Inc. magazine or, um, or you know, any of those. We hired a bunch of business journalists from, Co, or from Inc. to come and run Co. But I talked with them the other day to get a finger on the pulse of what visitors are looking for. Mm -hmm. So if we're looking at the top searches, the number one search for the past six months has been identity-based certifications. Mm -hmm. Women-owned businesses, minority-owned businesses, AAPI-owned businesses. So I'm seeing that like, that is a data point on interest in pursuing um, those certifications. Interestingly, the second highest search result over the last 30 days was how to fund my invention. Um, I guess that shows a little bit um, of hustle and creativity. Um, and then the third is how to avoid burnout when you're running a small business and you're the accountant and the CEO and the logistician and the driver and you're doing all of those jobs. Um, but this prompted us several months ago to establish what we're calling the Prompt Pay Pledge. And we've had a lot of big companies sign on already because the understanding was that longer um, payment terms 
are not um, advantageous to small companies, to small business owners. And you know, 45 days, 60 days, 90 days can really be a problem. So we've had about 100 companies sign on, things like Intuit, JP Morgan Chase, Bank of America, lots have signed on to commit to pay their small business um, vendors on, um, on quicker turnaround terms. And that has just been um, really successful. Feedback has been fantastic. But the things that we're hearing about every single day, every table here I think mentioned it, childcare, worker shortage, um, and we have a couple of programs that I wanna talk about, maybe we can come back again. Veterans and military spouses are a huge overlooked, you wouldn't believe it, but hugely overlooked population full of talent. Um, and there are a lot of um, good learnings and best practices and case studies around second chance hiring, which everyone wants to do from their heart, but can be pretty scary. And as a business owner, you have a lot of questions, and I think role models and case studies can really help come overcome some of those early challenges. So there's a lot to talk about in terms of how to cast a wider net, how to look at skills-based hiring, not four-year college degrees, which have become a proxy for skills, and it's, it's not, uh, not a great proxy. So there's a lot happening out there with community colleges like Tri-C here, with employers, employer collaboratives. There is a lot available, probably more than ever before, to a small business owner to, to start, run, and grow, and hire. So, Larry, I'm going to turn this to you now as, as a small business investor and uh, owner-operator. Uh, lots of resources that are out there. What would be helpful from a small business perspective in terms of being able to access these resources, or what are some additional policy or program ideas on either the growth side or on, on addressing some of these hiring challenges? You know, really, on the access side, or access side um, I, I think that there are a number of access points that's needed, five actually. Um, access to capital, access to equity, mm -hmm. access to a, a qualified and educated workforce. Um, I think you also need access to mentorship. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, I'd, I'd say uh, access to deal flow. And um, each one of those, now, there could be some more like access to, to technology, but each one of those are access points that from an entrepreneurial community and access points from an entrepreneurial's perspective that you absolutely must have. And so um, if I can just go into maybe one yeah, or two please. of those, those points. So one point in terms of access to education, um, here in the state of Ohio, there's uh, 607 school districts. Mm -hmm. um, we are so fortunate here in Cleveland to have uh, the school district of Solon, Rocky River, and Chagrin Falls. That's the number one, number two, and number three, respectively, school district here in the state of Ohio. But we also have number 607 out of 607, which is East Cleveland. And also, we have one of the largest school districts in the entire country, which is the city of Cleveland public schools uh, system. And so even though we have a, we have a brand new CEO or, uh, to come lead the school system, and all of us, um, especially people here, policymakers, uh, we need to try to support him to do his job to change the school system. And the reason why that's so important is because as an entrepreneur, um, as a person in society, you know, I know that you cannot have a thriving uh, entrepreneurial community, a thriving business, even a, a thriving society with a failing school system. And so Cleveland is just a microcosm of all the major school systems within the United States. And so I think we just need to do a better job securing education because we need these, these people that are graduating, uh, not just from the top one, two, and three uh, schools, but also from all the school systems to be contributing members of society and contributing members of our, our business. Just to, sure. really quickly. Um, the other thing would be access to equity that I'd, I'd like to point out. So if you are a person of color, and you're trying to access equity in your house for a HELOC or home equity line of credit or whatever your purpose is, more often or more likely than not, your home is going to be devalued during that process. Let me repeat that. If you are a person of color and you're trying to access the equity in your house, more often than not, regardless of the location of that house, 
it's going to be devalued. Okay? What does that really mean? So last year, uh, the Brookings Institute, I just looked this up uh, just the other day, the, the Brookings Institute came up with a study that said the collective equity, lost equity for African Americans, not just people of color, but African Americans, uh, equaled more than 156 billion, with a B, dollars. And so that's lost equity, that's lost opportunity. That's taking money away from people who could reinvest in their house, to beautify their house, to look at higher education opportunities, to look at entrepreneurial opportunities, to hire more employees. Those new employees would pay probably millions of dollars worth of taxes. And so we have a situation here where I think that access point of equity is being disturbed because home appraisers, they're doing what they want. Um, and I think as policymakers, we must uh, make sure that we're, we're, we're following the laws that are, you know, making sure that they're following the laws that are already in place. So I hope that answers no, your sure, question. Good. Yeah. Thank you, Larry. Yeah, I want to go back to actually a couple of points that were brought up regarding the ecosystem, uh, workforce development, and access to equity. Uh, one of that is for workforce development, what we are doing at the SBA here in the Great Lakes region is we are partnering with local community workforce uh, centers and actually having small business owners come and talk about the innovative ways that they are recruiting mm -hmm. for their small businesses. Uh, that is, again, you know, traditionally SBA was known as um, capital credit counseling but we also have been doing for a number of years convening and connecting. So this is our way of convening people and small business owners sharing their stories. The other thing about workforce brought up returning citizens right here in Ohio, the Columbus District Office, and actually I'm gonna be there in a couple of months, will be signing a strategic alliance memorandum with the Ohio Department of Corrections. We'll be going and working with the governor's offices of that Department of Corrections to be actually begin acclimating those who are about to uh, become returning citizens and get them prepared for entrepreneurship as one of the crafts that they're learning as they are learning a new skill or upskilling as well, because we know it can be challenging to find a job. Second one, uh, access to capital. I like to say there's three kinds of uh, capitals that we would like to deploy equitably for entrepreneurs. Social capital, financial capital, but there's also um, uh, the social capital, financial capital uh, is a piece of that as well. And how we do that is there are three priorities that we have at the SBA under Administrator Guzman. Customer service, how are we modernizing the SBA to meet people where they're at? The other one, equity forward, embedding that in our products, modernizing the rules for lending that will be coming out August 1st as well to broaden access to our capital uh, networks and through our intermediary lenders and our CDFIs and community banks, as well as credit unions also. And technology. I know you said technology, Larry, is, could be an access point. It definitely is an access point with e-commerce being a critical tool and small businesses will be left behind if they don't know how to harness technology for their operations. So it is a, it's beyond marketing, Instagram or TikTok, as some of them think, but it's also how do you harness marketing for tech-enabled operations so that you can use, I'm glad I actually have my phone, your phone to actually check the schedules of your employees and make it easier. Because as Larry said, you know, it's challenging to be that small business owner who's also the accountant, who's also looking at the law, who's working in your business and on your business. So we are trying to make it easier to access our resources, our no cost and free counseling and affordable financing products as well, while building those social networks and the knowledge capital. I'm sorry, number three is knowledge capital, but that's what, basically what we're doing. So thank you for the access points because you kind of yeah. triggered me to remember the three access points for capital that I always say. Smart. So I'm going to go back to Carolyn. I, there's a lot here that you guys have just put on the table. And so we're going to, uh, again, we're going to turn it open for questions here in about 10 minutes. And Carolyn, I want to go back to, to workforce and talent. Uh, you sort of put some things on the table, both groups that are probably overlooked. Uh, but also examples of how small businesses and companies are working with institutions, yeah. whether it's local community I, colleges or schools. Can you give a couple I examples? I love of, to tell these stories yeah. about a couple of things that are really, really working in um, specific communities because we know that these solutions have really to be place-based and to be responsive to the conditions and the um, resources and the availabilities in a particular community. Um, but I want to tell you a story, and stick with me for a second, because there's a little bit of explaining to do. About eight years ago, um, a really smart guy on our workforce team had a theory that businesses 
know really well how to manage their supply chains for all kinds of materials and other things required to do their business. And there's a methodology and a profession and a high degree of specificity. But yet, if humans, if, if employees are our most precious asset, the, they're not being, the, the, chain, uh, the supply chain of human talent wasn't receiving that same level of attention and same level of detail and rigor. And so he had this theory and did a white paper and then had a round table and then that turned into a conference. And so here we are eight years later where it is um, an accepted principle of supply chain management that's been certified by the association of supply chain management. Um, last week, SHRM, the Society of Human Resource Management, accepted this talent pipeline management credential um, that we created and, and launched um, as a SHRM credential. And as I said, it's taking basic principles and methodologies from supply chain management and using them in the ways that you scout and, and retain look for great suppliers, great vocational schools, great community colleges, establish those partnerships. Like, you would never put up a sign in the window that says steel needed and think steel's gonna show up, right? But we do that with help wanted all the time. And, sure. and you know, we're just very unspecific. You would never say, you know, I think I need about a ton of rebar. I don't know, bring it Tuesday. <laughs> a little more, a little less, you know. But we, we're not as exacting with needs around specific job skills. So that gave birth to the Talent Pipeline Management Initiative. We've been teaching this now in academies in 44 states. <clears throat> Employers mostly medium and small. And the reason I bring this up here is that one of the most effective components of Talent Pipeline Management is the formation of employer collaboratives. So you could be one employer and maybe you need three welders. That's probably not enough for the vocational school or the community college to be responsive to you. But if a lot of manufacturers in the community got together and said, you know what, collectively, we, this community needs 100 more welders. Mm -hmm. Or how about this? The transition to the, to, the, to the green economy, we are one million electricians short. Right? Those solar panels, those EVs, the batteries, all of that. We're not prepared for that from a tradesman um, perspective. So um, just to give you a little bit, um, a couple of examples. One of the tenets of supply chain management is getting um, employers to specifically articulate what it is they need. And then go talk to the suppliers, if you will, to make sure that those needs are, are aligning. So in Phoenix massive shortage in healthcare assist, in the healthcare industry, specifically in phlebotomists, in um, nursing assistants. Every hospital, every medical clinic was having the same problem. So they got together as a group of about 10. They went and pulled together a group of about 10 community colleges and schools and worked it out, established a common language. It sounds simple, but it was actually hard. It's a, it's a structured way to define. Now there's a much clearer path, fewer barriers out of training um, right into employment. In Michigan, six chemical manufacturers were each having their own problems um, recruiting. They got together, in fact, one of those chemical manufacturers told us he had turned down a $10 million contract because he couldn't attract enough workers at the entry level to fulfill. Um, so six of them got together, and their problem was a little bit different, right, from the healthcare industry. Theirs was making chemical manufacturing um, interesting and attractive to high school students and others who, who they wanted to stay in town. They didn't want to have that brain drain, right? So they established a year-long program of bringing projects on site into high schools, guest lecturer programs. Again, not rocket science in every way, but doing it in a structured way has helped them fill today 98 out of 102 chemical manufacturing jobs in that particular county. Um, there are you know, many more um, instances like this in Tallahassee, interestingly, big tech town serving the, um, the state government there. They can't keep them because everyone thinks it's more cool to live in Austin. Um, so for them, it was really a retention issue. 80 of them, 80 tech companies in Tallahassee, have gotten together to use this framework 
around retention uh, and brain drain. So it's just very place-based, very specific um, to that community. Um, another um, fact that you should know, and this is, about, um, I spoke earlier about overlooked individuals. It's a little bit crazy that military veterans and military spouses who are highly skilled would have trouble finding jobs, but it's true. And one of the reasons um, is that if you don't have a college degree, applicant tracking systems don't scan necessarily for skills. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of highly skilled applicants just fall right out of the system. And so for that reason, I think more emphasis on skills-based hiring from the employee want perspective, but also the technology perspective and greater awareness around it. Some big companies are doing it, um, but there are behavior change challenges, there are technology challenges, as I mentioned with the applicant tracking systems. Um, but several states have dropped the four-year degree requirement. The federal government has dropped it for several jobs. Um, and so as small business owners of even up to 500 employees, if you think about, does that job really require a four-year degree or what are the skills that I'm actually interested in? So that's a whole other level of, of learning. And it might also surprise you to know that the unemployment rate among military spouses is more than 30%. Wow. Um, and interestingly, one of the most highly educated groups in our population because if you're an, Ar I say this as a military spouse myself, if you're an army wife and you've moved to some pretty rural places and you're living in Fort Knox and you're trying to keep, keep your um, you know, brain engaged and there's not a lot of um, employment opportunities there or your husband's deployed and you can't have childcare, what do you do in that situation? You go back to school. So it's a highly, um, highly educated, um, one of the, the groups with the most, um, highest percentage of master's degrees, but yet severely underemployed. So um, we've got big programs around veterans and military spouses as really desirable um, So a couple of uh, employees. great ideas there that are obviously in execution, whether it's sector partnerships is what we call these industry collaboratives and certainly yeah. chambers and the Small Business Administration are different places where these convene and then also just skills-based hiring. And, some of our largest employers here, the private employers, as well as the publics, have gone in that direction. But as you said, lots of change required internal to the organization to accept yeah. that transition. Larry, from the employer's perspective, what are some incentives, program ideas, or policy ideas that you would suggest that the governments, writ large, local, state, federal, could look for to support small businesses that want to explore these types of more flexible or innovative workforce solutions? Well, um, a couple of things. So before I answer that, I'd, I'd like to say from an entrepreneurial perspective, you know, I, I look at uh, workforce challenges, and I talk to a lot of different companies. I'm on the board of this company, this firm called Magnet, yep. um, a board of a, a firm called uh, Jumpstart as well. So I'm, I'm constantly looking at entrepreneurs and talking to people. Um, I think one of the challenges, if you're an entrepreneur or you're, you're, you're facing the entrepreneurial perspective, that uh, because of the workforce challenges that exist today, you have to be looking at automation. Um, yeah. That is a business imperative, and I, I think from a board level conversation standpoint, you have to be looking at automation, how that impacts your on-time delivery, how that impacts your, your quality, your throughput, efficiency, et cetera. Um, the, the other thing that I think that companies need to be looking at, um, just through conversations, are if you are looking um, towards automating your, your processes, is using what I would consider more predictive technologies, uh, Web 4.0, um, operational efficiency technologies that would allow the equipment that you have, if it's a, a press, a CNC machine, a saw, you know, these, these machines um, you know, are now the primary driver of the production for a lot of companies. And as these companies automate, they have to track uh, the performance of this piece of equipment. And if, if, if you're not, your competition is. And I think that could create a, a sustainable competitive moat around your business um, that a, a lot of companies really should be looking at. Now, in terms of policy, I would say you know, the, the thing that, that comes to mind, the forefront of, of my mind is from an educational standpoint, I talked about earlier, you know, companies now have to train the workforce and that costs money. It's, 
It's a sustainable expense. I mean, it's, it's a predictable, consistent expense now, right? Like rent. Um, and so if you have to train your workforce, which is undoubtedly going to happen in the foreseeable future, this is, you know, the new normal, essentially. We need money, um, tax credits, uh, cap cost of capital reduction, uh, di different types of tax incentives to enable that to happen. If my expenses are now increasing because I have workforce training, workforce development, I have the cost of ob obtaining a new workforce, you know, as a small business entrepreneur, please help me. Yeah, and I, and can, can I jump in yeah, Please, Carolyn, go. We're actually working on something similar to that, and we should, we should talk afterward, which is um, the notion of having skills savings accounts in the same way that you have a health savings account with your employer. And that can really be a game changer for lower income workers who are needing to upskill at a really fast pace that's just getting faster and faster. And so um, we just put out a paper on this to say that you know, the health savings accounts and, and some other things that the feds put together with the tax code have been useful um, but the fact of the matter is that the educational benefits with many employers today um, are not that well utilized, and most people who use them are white-collar people going to law school at night. Or, you know, it's not very skills-based. It's not really about upskilling, and we think the ability to upskill fast and do it in six-week, uh, you know, increments, particularly if you have a full-time job and a family, you can't afford to leave, go to school full time, float that reimbursement later for tuition later. So um, there's, there's a real movement and some thinking around establishing skills savings accounts as a kind of sister to mm -hmm. health savings that's accounts. A, that's a really interesting policy idea. And I'm gonna uh, ask them to turn down the lights so we can open up for audience Q&A now. But just to comment on that as we go to the audience. Um, so in Ohio, one of the most popular programs for assisting employers on the skills training is something called tech credits, tech credentials. And it basically reimburses employers for supporting their employees and obtaining skills in a whole degree of certifications, but it's for jobs that exist at that employer. Right. Now, from a policy perspective, one of the things that we're concerned about, certainly in the greater Cleveland area, is the disruption that's coming due to technology may require you to learn skills that are going to be relevant for some other employer, or some other job somewhere else. And so this idea of a personal skills-based account that you could take so that you can prepare yep. might help us get ahead of the disruption that is absolutely going to occur as technology mm -hmm. continues to change uh, the labor market. So yep. we'll turn, the, go ahead, Jerry. We, yeah, let's turn up the lights, but let's go ahead, Jerry. Thank you. I, I think one of the things that we've been doing in the Great Lakes region with my colleagues who lead up the various district offices in the Great States is I've been talking with community college chancellors, vice presidents and such who are housing small business development centers that are aligned with this SBA. And we've been discussing ways on how we can get them better connected who are going through the workforce training through the community colleges like Tri-C so that they better understand what the SBA is and their resources so that by the time they finish upscaling or learning a trade because not everybody's going to go on to college not everybody's going to get a four-year degree and you know as President Biden says there needs to be an opportunity that he intentionally wants to carve out so that you have good work and good jobs without having a college degree. I am working with my colleagues in all the district offices to intentionally have those discussions so that we better strengthen the ecosystem of support so they know whatever they hang their shingle up as they're going through, you know, whether it's technology, CNC, you know, nurses aid, which a lot of them actually do go on to hang their own shingles, they know where they can get that free assistance and that's where we can strengthen that workforce and small business development ties as well. Great. Question in the audience over here. Um, yeah, so I'm in Northeast Indiana, and I, I realize that every, every market is different, every region is different, um, but, but we're seeing some interesting things in Northeast Indiana um, with, with the workforce, um, at least in the rural part of the, of the region. Um, we have employers who are saying that they are short-staffed, they can't get employees, they have signs out and ads out and billboards all over the place. Um, but as a, as a frontline worker who is working directly with people who are seeking jobs, um, people cannot get jobs. They go to interviews and they don't get hired. Um, so 
we have employers saying we need help, we need employees, we need we need to get people in our in our in our manufacturing plants, um, and and these are not like high skilled jobs, right? Like you, you don't need a lot of training for these jobs. They're they're very frontline jobs in manufacturing, um, and we have employees who are very qualified for the work, um, not getting hired. So the manufacturers continue to say we're understaffed and we continue to have a whole bunch of people who say we can't get jobs. Um, so, so there's a disconnect there. So disconnect. It's a, the, yeah. I'm sorry. So Is this something you can speak to? It, does anyone want to talk to the kind of gap between employer expectations and kind of the, the talent pipeline that shows up and sort of how do you close that gap? Hmm. You're looking like Larry. From, I do have some thoughts uh, yeah. uh, to that. Um, there's there's certainly uh, still persistent low unemployment, but there's there's a, an extremely high job openings, um, obviously throughout the entire country, um, and as I, I stated earlier, there's just consistent demand that's driving some activity there. Um, you know, I I don't know about that particular circumstance, but what I see is there's there are employers that are learning to do more with less. Um, because they've spent so long now, you know, 24 months, 18 months, or, or what have you, so long now not having the labor that they need to fulfill their demand. And because of that, they've become a much more efficient organization. And as I commented just a few minutes ago about automation, some companies are moving towards automation. Um, they're looking at emerging technologies that don't require as much labor. And so they, they may be looking at very specific skill sets to fulfill their needs, whereas before, they may not have been so picky. Um, so I, I, I think what we may be seeing, and like I was reading a, r a report uh, last week from ENY or, or Deloitte, and it, it, was, it was referring to this, this skills gap that is very persistent. Um, however, in the same breath, they were also talking about the pending uh, increase in unemployment because of this, that same scenario. So I, I hope I answered that question. Well, and I think there's also still this ongoing transition within employers in terms of you know, the criteria that they may have and what they have to become comfortable and more flexible with given sort of the situation that we're in from a labor market perspective. I think we had a question over here. Hello, yes, uh, my name is Mark Kivas Gideon. Again, a small business owner based out of Wilmington, Delaware. Um, I wanted to first follow up with um, that question there. So I'm a small business. I have about 20 employees right now, but what we've done was we started a nonprofit three years after um, beginning, and that right there created a workforce development program, therefore filling my need as I scale up my business, and then also helping other local companies be able to hire from our classes. So that right there has been tremendously helpful over the past five years. But as a small business, again, I've used Chamber of Commerces and I've used the SBA. And one thing I've realized um, through another program, Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses, is that um, one policy that should probably be changed that hasn't been in over 22 years is the reauthorization of the SBA. And I wanted to know if anybody is playing in that space right now and what are your thoughts because I believe that it's going to create more opportunity for entrepreneurs, giving us more education, giving us more resources by making these programs through the SBA stronger. Do you thank, wanna, thank you for are that you question. able to speak to that? Sure. sure. Uh, 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 SBA has actually modernized its programs. We don't need to be reauthorized, as many federal agencies actually have not been reauthorized for decades. It, we are still uh, making progress and modernizing even our lending rules, which I, I said earlier was going to be coming out August 1st. We did not need reauthorization for that. Uh, the SBA is also, we, during COVID, as I, not only did we, I say we have suspended the fees, which is something that you will see no other financial institution do, in the world, but we were the largest ones who were the largest, I guess, bank, so to speak, that suspended phase during COVID for all borrowers for six months, not paying the principal, not paying interest, and not paying fees. Now, if that's not modernizing and meeting people where they're at, you know, that's one of the ways that we have actually, you know, risen up to the occasion to support deploying access to capital to more diverse communities because we know full well that 44% of small business owners who applied for capital were not able to get it because of systemic biases and, and, and you know, some of those 
barriers that we've seen for decades. And we are modernizing our products, making it easier, reducing the barriers, making it easier for lenders to also underwrite for underserved communities. Because we know life happens. We understand and we have products to meet people where they're at, as Larry knows, uh, working for the SBA, that maybe in 2008, as far as back, with the recession, you may still have some debts because healthcare wasn't affordable then. But we understand that. And we've got flexible financing for those credit needs to deploy more capital to women, rural owners, black and brown communities, and all the diverse communities, including veterans, by the way. And by the way, thank you for bringing up veterans, the VBOC centers. We have two that serves the state of Ohio. Uh, the Veterans Business Opportunity Centers do not only serve veterans. We also support spouses and their families as well, so that their spouses and their partners also have a chance of chasing that American dream and making it become a reality. I'd like to actually speak to the gentleman who, from nor uh, Northeast Indiana for rural. I can tell you from observation as regional administrator and as, as a professional, um, it has come to my attention and others as well that it's very challenging in rural areas to hire because you do have a limited pool of individuals. Um, this has been brought up uh, also in other Federal Reserve spaces as well. But that's where we have the investment in rural revitalization and the renaissance under President Biden. We've actually expanded governor identified hub zones so that small businesses that are there can actually get a piece of the pie of doing business for the federal government and create more jobs as well. So we are expanding opportunities for small businesses to actually increase their revenues, move into underserved rural areas, particularly rural areas, to help with the economic and community development there. So that's kind of the more medium and long-term game, but we are hoping, and, and we have seen in the past, to see some of those benefits of those governor expanded hub zones to support rural areas in the United States and here in the Great Lakes region. So thank you for your question. I don't know if you're from Fort Wayne and such, uh, uh, that Northeast area, but well familiar with that. Your Women's Business Center got regional award. <laughs> quick, uh, quick comment, then I see two questions on the audience. Go ahead. Okay, so I'll try to make this very quick. Um, from an SBA standpoint, I, I think an affiliate program called SCORE um, that talks to that access of mentorship that I, I mentioned earlier, Enhancing that program could be vitally important. Already, SCORE has over 10,000 volunteers uh, that donate over a million hours worth of, of time to help small businesses. And so what I mean by expansion is expand the marketing, expand the budget to make sure that everyone knows about such an organization. That could be vitally important. Even on this stage right now, I have two SCORE volunteers that hold me accountable. Um, I meet with them once every three weeks, and they ask me the hard questions. They keep me accountable. Um, they don't let my excuses uh, stop my progress. And so that's one thing I, I, I'd like to mention. The other thing is, going back to, uh, I think, point number two that I made earlier, access to equity. Um, access to capital, access to equity. Um, access to equity. So you know, in addition to the, the home equity you know, scenario, uh, scenario that, that I pointed out, is access to equity for all entrepreneurs, minority, non-minority entrepreneurs, is very challenging. And so I, I think having more access, more, more flexibility, not necessarily reliance or reduction in, in, um, in loan structure, but actually terms, um, maybe a relax or a reduction in, in perhaps equity contribution. So every capital stack has essentially a few different um, capital access you know, tranches. One would be cash or equity that's going to come into a deal from a buyer. Sometimes you might see that from a seller as well. And then you have your, your senior, senior debt. And in addition to that senior debt, which typically comes from a bank, you also might have, you know, a, an interest only balloon payment at the end type of mezzanine financing, right? And then for, for public transactions, there's a whole other different type of capital. But for small businesses, you typically have equity and you have debt, right? A lot of entrepreneurs, particularly African-American entrepreneurs, don't have access to equity because of the scenario that I pointed out earlier or just because of life circumstances. A lot of non-entrepreneurs uh, of color just don't have access to equity. So I, I think having collaborations with banks, uh, facilitating these types of discussions around how do you bridge that gap for entrepreneurs to actually have equity contribution, um, perhaps uh, 
different terms like I spoke of earlier that might bring down that equity contribution might uh, significantly help entrepreneurs. And, and Larry, you make a good point because with the products that we have and the new rules coming out, we are actually making permanent, for example, the Community Advantage Loan Program. Now that began under President Obama in order to deploy more dollars to black and brown communities, low, moderate income small business owners in rural and urban areas. We have seen that a success with so many small business owners, but there were lenders that were a little unsure of whether or not it was gonna be a pilot or was it gonna be made permanent. It is now with the new rules being made permanent under the SBA, and that's the type of lender you know, I like to make it akin to, they understand life happens, they're the, if you've seen A Wonderful Life, they're like the George Bailey Banks versus, you know, Mr. Potter. But they have flexible capital standards, underwriting standards that they currently have with those small business owners who may be low moderate income, maybe in an underserved area, maybe in a rural area, and they meet them where they're at with that availability to pay and the assets that they have, knowing that they have little assets. Because we know at the SBA, and I know full well personally, owning a small business, speaking of home ownership, is the next best way to build wealth in America. And that is our commitment to equity and making sure that we are modernizing our programs and products and making sure that more people know about these flexible capital products, but also on the equity end, as I mentioned earlier, our small business investment companies as well. And the innovation, I'm always excited to see what Beiju shares in Greater Cleveland with the manufacturing and advanced manufacturing. We have SBIR and STTR grants. Now those are grants for small business owners who are doing innovative research and development in the STEM related field. And if there is some place that we, I personally would love to see diverse small businesses grow, it's investments in those high growth tech STEM related industries because that will also accelerate inclusive economy here in the greater Cleveland area, but also the Great Lakes area as well, because we are investing in America and retaking. Most people don't realize historically, we were the ones that invented the microchip years and years ago. And we are you know, harnessing that, that mantle and leadership again. Right. So we have a question over here and then we've got over here. So yes. start over here, sir. So to that point, uh, especially going back to the conversation regarding workers, uh, and you guys have alluded to it earlier regarding a curriculum based solutions, and I think you got to look at a solution that goes before high school. We have so many young people that are turned off to uh, trade options and other, other uh, career sets before they even get to, you know, the ninth grade. And we have to do a better job of preparing them. But then on the flip side, we have a situation where there's a population of young people out there, you know, we're talking between 25 and 40, if you want to call that young, but between 25 and 40, that did not get the support necessary within some of the educational processes. And they're difficult to support through these training endeavors. And, and so what do you see as a, a mechanism to help that population? Because I think that might be something you've seen in North, Northern, Northeastern Indiana, where we have this population of folks who are somewhat difficult to train or haven't had the experiences. Yeah, Jared, you want to take Yeah, this? let me show you something really exciting in, again, the straight grade of OHIO uh, that they're doing in Columbus area and Dayton area as well with the district offices there. We have partnered and formally signed an agreement with Wilberforce University, uh, HBCU, uh, but we are also working with the public schools there through the mayors as well to deliberately go in and do a training for the high school students who may eventually go to Wilberforce or maybe they'll go to you know the Ohio State University and such but we are beginning to open the doors that entrepreneurship is a path no matter what their craft or intention is so I'm very excited that we signed that that strategic alliance memorandum with Wilberforce but I'm also working intentionally with Mayor Mims in Dayton with Mayor Williams in Riverside as well and other mayors to make sure that they identify the high schools that they feel are at risk and most need to get SBA exposure with the mayor's offices as well. And it looks like we're going to soon be expanding that partnership with uh, Wright State also. So we are beginning to do that. This is the what I personally call the and also approach. We work with the chambers and also the mayors. And this is what I feel is good government at the national level, the regional level, and at the local level, working together to expand the idea and the concept of entrepreneurship, no matter what your trade or study is. Great, next question is back there. Go ahead, Hi. yes ma'am. 
Um, Murray Walker Smith, Chester County Economic Development Council. I just have two points here. One, um, you know, I, I definitely want to commend you for trying to identify opportunities to release funding into the community. But what we're finding is that, um, you know, funding is only one aspect of helping people build their business. Um, so people get loans and build their business, but then they don't have a, a marketing plan. Um, they do not know how to scale their business, how to identify um, new uh, consumers, and so then they're faced with essentially new debt and no way um, or no skills to really help them mm -hmm. to, to pay for that debt or to, to scale up their business. So that, that's my, my first question. Um, you know, are there any programs that you um, can think of that kind of works lock and step with the funding that's being distributed in addition to um, helping people grow their business? Uh, my second point is um, really about uh, vocational training. I think this gentleman over here touched on that. Um, you know, in, in the African American community, success is measured by, oh, you know, you got accepted to, to college. And, um, you know, when we talk about public schools, we know that vocational training is basically being cut specifically in a lot of the low um, underperforming school districts. And so how do we um, get that funding back into the schools so that students can access that vocational training uh, I know in Tennessee, they've seen an increase in um, those types of programs simply because the community college fee is free. So is that a model that could simply be implemented across the, the country so that um, that would be an incentive for more students to consider um, you know, uh, vocational trades? And last but not least, um, again, we have to start to understand the new generation of population that we're serving. While we are, you know, thinking about, you know, mechanical um, engineering and things of that sort, social media um, and social media influencers, there are kids that are at home in their pajamas and making videos and racking in $100,000 a year. Um, how do we get you know, that kind of training, because that's really where everything is headed, digital design, e-commerce for global business models. How do we introduce those kinds of um, training skills as part of vocational as well? Great, all right, so three questions that I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you guys, get in the interest of time to do kind of quick answers. I'm gonna throw the first one, Larry, to you, because you talked a little bit about the importance of mentorship and the SCORE program. How do we make sure that as individuals get funding, they also get access to these other resources so that they don't just take on debt. Yeah, exactly. I, I was going to talk about SCORE. Um, so SCORE, that acronym uh, really means the um, Service Corps of Retired Executives, right? And these are individuals that are retired. They have a wealth of knowledge. They are in a variety of different markets and industries. They've either sold their business, uh, they've, they've moved on to bigger and better things in their life, but they want to give back. And they give back an unprecedented amounts of, the, of their time. Um, I found SCORE to be very, very helpful. For an example, um, I had uh, a series of, of SCORE volunteers. If one doesn't necessarily be, uh, it's, it's one, if, if one of the volunteers, sorry, is not necessarily a good fit for me, I can replace him or her um, to make sure that the skills gap that is, is present can be solidified, right? So SCORE is, I, I think, a wonderful opportunity. Uh, it's a free service. And uh, all you have to do is look on uh, SCORE, uh, SCORE.gov, I believe, or SCORE.org. Um, and so that's, 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 that's certainly an opportunity there. Uh, in, in terms of just, just yeah. very quickly here, I kind of think about um, that there should be more marketing uh, towards some of the SBA services. Uh, like for an example, is there an app for that? And what I mean by that is, you know, when you go on your, your cell phone, uh, there should be an app for SCORE um, or maybe even some other organizations that you need, you know, uh, education or entrepreneurial training for, but particularly the SBA. Um, I, I did a, a Google search last night. I didn't see the SBA.gov on an app, 
And so my thought is initially, there should be an app for that. It should have entrepreneurial education opportunities. It should have the ability to pay back your loan. It should have the ability to set an appointment with a score uh, volunteer. It should have the ability to do a deal, uh, to get financing, uh, et cetera, right? Um, you know, certified or qualified portals that would allow that. And I think that would help bridge some of the opportunities there. Um, so I, I hope I answered that, no, that question. That's great. And so yeah. I'm going to throw the, the vocational training both for jobs that do exist and then the jobs of the future uh, to you, Carolyn. It feels like every year they say that the jobs that our children will have haven't even been invented yet. Um, so who knows what, you know, what we'll have in another 15 years. Um, I was talking with a woman at the reception last night. If you're here, I'm sorry that I don't remember your name, and maybe you can stand up and add to this story. But I, I think that part of the solution here is we have to dig into skills in a really meaningful way, in skills-based hiring, in skills training, in skills identification with a great deal of specificity and understanding the adjacencies. And so the, the woman I met last night um, was telling me that at the community college where she's the head of student affairs, they were surprised to find that some of the most proficient um, STEM students who were working on chips under microscopes, um, you know, with um, very sophisticated tools, miniaturized tools, the, the students who were the most adept at that were artists, had artist backgrounds, because they had an affinity for seeing pattern and they had an affinity for working with such small things. So I just think that was a really interesting example of kind of adjacent, um, adjacent skills. In terms of, of places where um, a, a, an entrepreneur or a business owner can go, I agree 100%. We see it all the time that grant money um, is great, but it's mentorship and, um, and having an executive um, from SCORE that really helps. Um, two years ago, two and a half years ago, we launched um, an, uh, an initiative called the Coalition to Back Black Businesses that was in, done in partnership with American Express and the four national black chambers of commerce. We, I mean, I wish we had enough money in the fund to, to give a grant to everyone, um, but we've been able to provide grants to um, almost 1,500 black small business owners. What they get with that is the grant and a year of one-on-one -on -one mentorship. Um, it's twice a month. It's someone who's accountable to them for their specific next level of need. Their, what I need now is a business plan, what I need now is a marketing plan, whatever their thing is. So I think that mentorship piece um, can't be undervalued or, or, um, or understated. Goldman Sachs 10,000 small businesses, I think was mentioned over here. I have only ever heard good things about that um, and kind of the wraparound services um, that come with that. The third is, um, it, it's actually an online platform out of Texas called Hello Alice. Um, she uses a tremendous amount um, of AI and tech to um, create online communities um, in, in really geo-targeted ways, uh, communities um, of affinity groups, of location groups, of industry groups, and there are a lot of mentor hours um, from executives that are um, being plowed into Hello Alice. So those are three that I think could be helpful. We have time for maybe one more question right here in the middle. Good afternoon. We spent a lot of the last session, sorry. Loud. We spent a lot of the last session talking about affordable housing and childcare. So I wonder if you guys have any input on what role employers have to play in assisting with the cost of housing or childcare for their for their employees. So, and I'm going to turn this to really I'm small happy. businesses in particular, but Carolyn, go. I'm happy to take childcare. Um, it has been a tentpole of our work ever since, actually predating COVID. And if anyone can remember back that far, childcare was kind of relegated to it was like you know, paid family leave and women's issues and not taken very seriously as a workforce issue. And of course, the pandemic changed all that. I mean, we still have a million women who have not returned to the workforce, citing childcare as the principal barrier. I'm sure there are many. Um, and that's to all businesses, including small businesses. Um, we think that employers need to really get in the driver. I mean, that if employers can't get the employees they need and childcare is a chief barrier, there need to be solutions. Um, we created a, a guidebook and a roadmap for employers to understand the two dozen or so different things they could do. 
and it needs to be right for the size of their company and the, the profile of their employee and what's available in their community. Because the other part of the untold story on childcare is the childcare providers, small businesses, overwhelmingly women, overwhelmingly women of color, working on razor tight margins and not a lot of runway for credit. And they went out of, they were among the first um, to, to go out of business during COVID. So um, I think what can employers do? I think they really need to look at the employee population and match that with the community. The example I'll give you, um, we worked with a, um, an auto manufacturing plant that was being built in North Carolina. They had to hire 3,000 people or this plant wasn't gonna turn on. And it was a real problem, they couldn't. And the number one problem that came back in all of these interviews was childcare. In addition, compounded by the fact that they have a 24-hour manufacturing facility, so it was not just you know kind of regular nine to five; it was night shifts and and um, and lots of kind of odd hours. And so, what are their options? They could build a childcare facility. They could offer subsidies. They could do you know a number of things. What they ultimately decided was right for their employees and for the community was to form partnerships with the small business child care providers and be their steady, steady source of business. Um, and so in that way, kind of being a preferred you know, pipeline, if you will, of, of children and who needed child care and, and that allowed families to go back to work. So it's what I said earlier, I think it's very place-based and it's really digging into your specific population and your specific um, community. But it's the number one problem, hands down. It's the, it's the issue for our time. Well, with that, we're gonna have to close this session. Please join me in thanking Caroline, Larry, and Jerry. Thank you. It's, it's been a wonderful panel. From here, all of you will be heading across the hallway to the breakout sessions, which will start promptly at 1.35. Thank you. <laughs>